Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study. Still got a little bit of uh, blessing in my throat. We'll call it a blessing, all right? Galatians chapter 3, uh, we're going to get to the meat of God blessing faithful Abraham. And we're going to uh, examine the issue of are we saved by grace through faith? Are we saved by grace through faith plus works? Um, what was James teaching when he talked about Abraham and how he was justified works or justified by works? Is that a contradiction to what Paul's saying in Galatians? It's not. And I'll, I'll show you that. Let's start in Galatians. Let's see what Paul said concerning grace by faith instead of grace or God giving you things like eternal life and <clears throat> good health and a clear throat by performing works, by doing good things out of the law or by performing rituals or saying the sacred name correctly or whatever. So here's what he said, Galatians 3, 5. He therefore that, <clears throat> excuse me, he therefore that minute. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. We are the seed of Abraham, even though my lineage does not come from Abraham or through Abraham. I am of the seed, I'm accounted as the seed of Abraham because I believe what God said and I'm counting solely upon God, Jesus Christ and his word to bring me salvation rather than me counting on me to give me salvation. That's the difference. The scripture, verse 8, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. They which be of faith, being born again by our faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his word. Let's go to Genesis chapter 16. We've looked at uh, several aspects of Abraham in this study, uh, starting in Genesis 12. When he was, and in Genesis 16, he's still Abram. Genesis 12, he's Abram. Genesis 13, when God said, look northward, southward, eastward, and westward, he was still Abram. The new name had not been given to him yet. A new name always signifies being born again, salvation. Uh, when I was born, my parents gave me the name Michael Wayne Hoggard. Uh, where they got the Michael Wayne, I don't know. I know that John Wayne has a son named Michael, okay? Anyway, I'm not saying I was named after John Wayne's son, but anyway, they gave me a name at my birth. It's on my birth certificate, which is an American birth certificate. Okay, okay, he's not president anymore, so let's move on. Um, when you are born again, you are given a new name to go along with your new birth. Jesus teaches that in the seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation. You know, he that endures to the end, I will give him a white stone and a new name written on that stone. Um, Paul received a new name. Acts chapter 13, <clears throat> excuse me, he's going by Saul. That was his human born name. Then on the Damascus road, he was converted, he was born again. Now he's called Paul. It's funny, the Hebrew roots people, they don't like calling him Apostle Paul. They prefer to use the title and the name Rabbi Saul or Rav Shaul. Okay, they even got to say it in Hebrew. That's not who he was. He was not Rabbi Saul. He was the Apostle Paul. 
And so anyway, Genesis uh, 12, 13, 14, 15, we've looked at all of those. <clears throat> now we're going to get into Genesis 16. And here's what, here's what was said in verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had in handmaid an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. Later on in the book of Galatians, in chapter 4, we're going to see the significance of Sarah and Hagar and their two children, both of them coming from the loins of Abraham. Let me back up. Ishmael came from the loins of Abram. Isaac came from the loins of Abraham. All right? And, and to me, I think that's significant. I think God is showing us this pattern of when Ishmael was born, number one, uh, Abraham was still Abram. Number two, Sarah was still Sarai. Number three, it wasn't Sarah. It was the Egyptian bond woman, bond servant, slave. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> Sarai, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. She had an handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah, and, or excuse me, Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan, see the number 10? Okay? And when we get to Galatians 4, you're going to see very plainly that Hagar and Ishmael are a type of those who are born under the Mount Sinai covenant, the Ten Commandments, the law. The law hath dominion. Then we see very clearly that Sarah, her son was different because Sarah and Isaac, Sarah's a free woman, Isaac was free, and Isaac was a child of promise, not a child of commandment. And that's why the number 10 is here. Why does the Bible need to go out of its way to give you this little piece of information about Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan? Who cares? Unless God is just sort of pointing something out. Abram being here 10 years, the number 10 referencing the law through the Ten Commandments. And so, and again, that bears into Ishmael being a child of bondage because he's under the law, all right? So anyway, and after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Now, there's something very interesting here that, and remember in the language of typology, um, a woman is always going to be a portrayal of a church, either the pure church without spot or wrinkle, the wise church, like in Proverbs 8, or the strange woman, the harlot, the disobedient church, all right? So here we have Sarai, who takes God's word and reinterprets it, saying it may be that God will raise up seed from me through Hagar. Sarai is saying, you know, I'm an old woman. I can't bear children anymore. I don't think I can handle it. And so I think what God meant was this. You see what I'm getting at? In Genesis 2, God gave the commandment to Adam. And he said in verse 16, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. I'll just throw out a little interesting piece of information here. In verses 16 and 17, you have recorded God's words for us, and it was a commandment. If you count 
in verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, if you start with of there and count all the words from of all the way through verse 17, where it says, thereof thou shalt surely die. You know what you'll get? You'll get 39 words exactly. And remember, that was God's law. How many books are there in the law? 39, exactly. And I want you to think about that then. God gave the commandment. It was supposed to be um, a life giver. But God knew that Adam and Eve would fail in this and thus bring the consequences of breaking God's law, which was death. So in these 39 words in your King James Bible, you, base, you essentially have a micro version of the entire Old Testament in that it's the law and the law cannot give you eternal life because the law is weak because it pertains to our flesh. And it has to do with eating here. God says all these trees you can eat. See that tree of life there? You eat that tree of life, you'll live. See that tree next to it? That's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat thereof, you, thou shalt surely die. Let me throw another thing in here. When God uses the, the word day, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, we know that the sun went down after Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, and we know that neither one of them died before the sun went down. We know that because after Genesis uh, 2 and 3, you have Cain and Abel from Adam and Eve. So we know that they did not physically die before the sun went down on the same you know, 12 hours of daylight day that they ate the fruit. Is God a liar? No. And some would say, well, they died spiritually. I don't, I don't see that here. What I do see is uh, what Peter said in 2 Peter, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. In the Psalms, David said, a thousand years are as but yesterday in thy sight. So a day has a dual meaning in the Bible. It could mean, and in many cases does mean, a 24-hour period, all right? Uh, like in the creation week, the evening and the morning were the first day. Evening and the morning were the second day, all right? But then you have, given by authority of God, that a day could mean a thousand years. So think about that. Adam lived 930 years. Methuselah lived 969 years. He was only 31 years short of living for a thousand years. And Methuselah is the oldest person we have record of in the Bible. And I see very clearly that before a thousand years expired, Adam died, Eve died, uh, Lamech died, Noah's father. E well, not, not uh, Enoch. Enoch was taken into heaven. But you get my point here. Methuselah and all these guys, none of them made it to be a thousand years old. They all died within that day that Adam ate the fruit. All right? So that's just kind of a little extra thing here for you to ponder. The Bible's never wrong. The Bible never contradicts itself. If you will allow the Bible to interpret the Bible, you won't get into the trouble that Eve got into and Sarai got into. Eve took what was given to her by her husband and she corrupted the Word of God. Think about it. Think about churches. A woman's the type of a church. Think about churches who corrupt the Word of God by adding to it, like Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism says it's the Bible plus the words of the Pope. They've added to the Word of God. Um, think of 
what Jesus dealt with in his day, the scribes and the Pharisees, the hypocrites, the generation of vipers. Because the Jews boasted about how they follow the law, but Jesus knew they didn't. Jesus knew that over the years, they had added commentaries to the law, and they followed the commentaries. They followed Jewish interpretation of the law, but they didn't follow the law, and Jesus nailed them for it. He said, you've made vain and void the law of God by your tradition. So the Jews interpreting God's word, they exalted their interpretation even above the word. All right? Ellen White. Ellen White says she has a vision. She goes to heaven, and there's the Ten Commandments written on a wall, and they're all blazing with light, but the Fourth Commandment blazes brighter than all the rest of them. And she said, I have the quote, she said that Christ died and nailed all of the commandments to the cross except the Fourth Commandment, which is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So here we have Ellen White not following the law, the Word of God, in following her interpretation of the law. Because the law in Exodus 20 never says a thing about mandatory church worship service must be on Saturday only, and you can't go to church on Sunday. Law never says that anywhere, but this is, they follow their interpretation. So Eve, in Genesis 3, takes God's word and adds to it. And it's a self-imposed regulation that God never said anything like that. I mean, here we have the devil contradicting God's word by saying, Yea, hath God said, and then he says, Ye shall not surely die. He contradicted God's word. Then we have Eve joining in saying, God has said we can't even touch it. And God's going, I didn't say that. If Adam had been there, Adam would have said, uh, Eve, uh-uh. That's not what God told me. I told you what God told me. God told me we couldn't eat of it. He didn't say a thing about not touching it. And so Eve was guilty of adding to the word of God. Here we have Sarah, who is guilty of interpreting God's law, God's commandment, God's blessing, and basically following her interpretation of what God said rather than what God said. You follow me here on this. And I've been guilty of it, so I'm pretty sure you're guilty of it or have been guilty of it. And I would like for my mind, I have a desire that I want to know only what the Word of God says as truth. And I would really like to just flush out my own private interpretations of God's law or God's word. We all do it. We have been guilty. And maybe some are still guilty of following their interpretation of scripture more so or rather than following God's interpretation of scripture. Because Sarai said, See, Hagar, she's my servant. I own her. Therefore, she's like my surrogate, my proxy. She is going to be standing in my place, or actually, in this case, laying down. And I'm just going, I, I can't wrap my head around that. Sarah actually telling her husband, sleep with my, my maid. Sleep with my slave. Maybe God will raise up seed that way, okay? So what goes bad here is when the church, when church people, number one, add to God's word, add their own private interpretation, and the church goes wrong, church people go wrong when they follow their interpretation of God's word and not God's word, not what God said. And I believe that the Bible is the, not only the best interpreter of the Bible, I believe that it is the only trustworthy interpreter of what God said. So read what God said. And if you are not sure that you understand it correctly, 
search the scriptures or wait and then search the scriptures because I promise you in due season, God will show you great and mighty things that you know not. But the worst thing in the world to do is try to come up with some interpretation of what you think that could mean and then follow that interpretation. That's what Sarah did. And it cost Abraham, he ended up losing Hagar, ended up losing his, what technically was his firstborn son, Ishmael. He ended up losing them both because of his wife. Now God had a purpose in that, but you see where everything goes bad here is where the church gets its hands in and begins to corrupt what God said. And we as church people are good at it. And it's not right. So I will plead with people. Let's have a pure doctrine that comes from a pure word of God. And in that, we cannot go wrong. When people ask me, Pastor, when do you think the rapture is going to be? I will say to them, at the last trump. And I'm not trying to avoid anything. I'm just giving them exactly what the Bible says. And if they ask me, if they press me and say, well, well, how, how do you, what do you believe that is? You believe that's the seventh trumpet? You believe it's this? You believe, I'm just, I believe it's at the last trump. And God knows what it is. He doesn't need me to tell him what the last trump is. So I'm just going to trust God that he's going to do exactly what his word says he's going to do. Now you may lose friends. You may not be invited to the next Bible study. But if you're like me, you have a conscience. And my conscience can't allow me, it doesn't let me get away with some sort of false private interpretation of God's word. And I've been guilty of doing it and probably will be guilty again. That's my sinful nature. But then God chastises us and he says, go back and read what that says. And I'll tell you something. You would be surprised at the things that you have overlooked in the word of God. That if you go back with an honest heart and read it again, you'll go, well, there's, there's the answer right there. There it is right there. So anyway, that's what happened. And so the trouble came when Eve added to God's word and followed that addition and Sarai adding her own commentary, her own imagination to what God said, and it caused problems, major problems. Now we're going to get down to it, Genesis 17. Here's where Abram becomes Abraham. A new name now has been written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Genesis 17, verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, 99, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now, that's not God's challenge. It's not God's challenge. It is God's blessing. Because I'm just, this is what I believe. If God says something, he means it. And if God says to Mike Hoggard, Mike Hoggard, be thou perfect. You know what? I am. And that, let me clarify that. The new man, 1 John tells us, that is on the inside of me is born of God and sinneth not. The old man, however, this here and this, I can dress it up all I want to. Comb my hair just right, make sure I'm shaven, make sure I have aftershave on and I smell decent. But the truth of it is, this is full of corruption. And it is not capable of being anything different than what it is. And what I want is for this old thing to die off so that which is perfect can stand and live before God. And when God says, be ye perfect, what I'm saying to you is, if God says it, his word has power in it. And if God says to you, be thou perfect, he's not challenging you to try to be the best you that you can be and try to be perfect. Because God knows that it won't work. If I just tell you, 
don't break the Ten Commandments ever again. The cop that pulled you over, the cop that pulled you over said, you need to slow it down. Yes, sir, I promise you, I won't, I won't speed again. You liar. You big, dirty liar, you. Okay? So what I'm telling you is speed limit signs do not ensure that everybody in the country doesn't go over 65 miles an hour on this particular highway. It doesn't work. All those signs are to give us what, tell us what the law is. And the truth of it is people get pulled over every day. Why? Because they broke the law and they did it knowingly, unknowingly, they broke the law. So God saying to Abram, be thou perfect. God had just perfected Abram's inner man, the new man. So watch this. Be thou perfect. Verse two. And I will make my covenant between me and thee. And something very important to keep in mind. And I and will multiply thee exceedingly. God made a covenant with Abraham and his seed. This covenant predates the Mount Sinai covenant. And Paul made a point to tell us that the Abraham covenant was in force before the Sinai covenant. Which means that the Abraham covenant is the one that is in place. And the Mount Sinai covenant cannot contradict it or override it. Can't do it. All right? So watch this. In verse 3, And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. Thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. I like this. I like this. Because even in English, the, the difference is the addition of the letter H. In Hebrew, it's the addition of the letter H. Hey. All right? In Great Britain, they don't say H like we do in the States. They say H. All right? Which I find, I, it's, it's funny to me. Okay? Uh, I, I think it's neat. It's cute. H. But I want you to get what's being added here. See that? He just added to Abram. Remember what Jesus did with his disciples? He went, receive you the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's what Abram gets. He gets the, he gets the breath. He gets the wind, the spirit in his name. Sarai to Sarah. See it? Same letter. Oh, I love this. Uh, For a father of many nations have I made thee. Verse 6. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of thee. And kings shall come out of thee. David, Solomon, Jesus. The king of kings came from Abraham. Abraham, excuse me. And what line did Jesus come from? Did he come from Ishmael? No. He comes from the line of the man who has the in his new name, the spirit. That's where Jesus comes from, all right? Um, let's see here. And I will establish, verse seven, verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Now here it is. God is, I got in Genesis 12, God gave Abram the promise, the blessing. In chapter 13, he did. Chapter 14, he did. Chapter 15, and chapter 16, he did. In chapter 17, now he changes Abraham's name and gives him the spirit, the breath, the pneuma. That's how it's said in, in Greek, all right? I was close to having pneumonia. What is that? It's a disease in my breath. And you can't, if you've ever had pneumonia, you can't breathe very well. It's very scary, all right? 
only after God gives this blessing to Abraham, only after that does God give to Abraham the token of that covenant, which is circumcision. Circumcision did not bring the blessing of God to Abraham and the spirit to Abraham. It was the other way around. Circumcision was a token or a sign of the promise that had already been made. You see that? And the real circumcision is the circumcision of this flesh body being taken off like the foreskin and revealing the inner man, the new man that is in us. Okay? That's what real circumcision is. It's the stripping away of this flesh so that the inner man can be presented to God, holy and blameless to God, all right? Uh, and if you keep reading in Genesis 17, you'll see that God gives Sarai the letter H, H in her name, all right? Now she's Sarah. Now she has breath in her, all right? And it's not through Hagar. It's not through Ishmael. It's through Abraham and Sarah. All right? I hope, I hope you get that. Um, if we go down to verse 17, then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? The number nine is the number for fruit bearing. There are nine fruits of the Spirit. They're found in the ninth book of the New Testament, Galatians. Okay? And I love, I love this stuff. So anyway, Ab Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Verse 19, And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. An everlasting covenant. The covenant that God made with Abraham is still in effect. And the covenant given at Mount Sinai, Paul said, cannot disannul the covenant that God made with Abraham 400 years before the law ever came. And the covenant of the law from Mount Sinai, it is so obvious that that covenant is no good anymore. Well, how, how is that obvious, Pastor Mike? You, you, you believe that we can go out and break the law and do whatever we want to? Oh, no, 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 no. But in order to fulfill the Mount Sinai covenant, they needed a temple or a tabernacle. They needed an Ark of the Covenant. And they don't have that. To this day, the Jews, in the temple that was there when Jesus died on the cross, and it had that big, huge curtain, right? The veil that was between the, the outer part, the holy place, and the most holy place. And when Christ died and gave up the ghost, there was, I mean, there was, there was an earthquake, and the veil rent. It ripped in half. And now the most holy place is open for everyone to see. And they're looking in there, and they're going, what's in there? Well, to be honest with you, Nothing. There's nothing in there. No ark, no throne. God did away with it. It is not possible to fulfill the law, the legal requirements of the Mount Sinai Covenant because there's no temple or tabernacle. There's no ark of the covenant. It's gone. It's done away. The Abrahamic covenant still in place, which is, I believe, Abram, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So we are saved by God's grace through faith. Then we have to deal with what James, because James brought in Abraham too. He mentions Abraham, and he says in James chapter 2, that was Abraham justified by faith, or was he justified by works? Let's read it. And let's get some understanding here, all right? 
And this is going to be the end of this part, dealing with Abraham. James chapter 2, verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? And some people, they really struggle with these verses because they say, well, it looks like here that we're justified by works. And then you have some who say, well, the book of James is not for us. And, and first and second Peter and Hebrews and Matthew, Mark and Luke and John. They're not for us. And Revelation and three Johns, they're not for us. They're for Israel. Israel has to be saved by works. However, we are saved by faith. I don't accept that. I don't believe that. I don't think the Bible teaches that at all, anywhere. You cannot, no one has ever been saved by the works. Let me show you how simple this is to understand this, all right? Uh, let me read the scripture. Verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What good, what doth it profit? What good are your words? These people came to you, and they needed food. Their baby needed formula or milk. They needed groceries. They needed gas in their car. And you just simply said, God bless you. Now get off my porch. Does that help them? Does that profit anything? Just you saying, well, God bless you. Okay, now watch this. Even so, verse 17, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Let me illustrate it this way. Here's faith, the New Testament. Here's works, the Old Testament. We still have the Old Testament. We have all the things that are given in here. And you know what? There's numerous places in the Old Testament where it tells you that we, the just shall live by what? Faith. So look at, it, look at it this way. Let's say faith is the New Testament, works is the Old Testament. They go together. And how have they gotten together? By way of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, even so, faith, New Testament... If it hath not works, Old Testament is dead, being alone. And I'm, I'm going to illustrate this in a very simple way. In fact, I'm basically going to do what James did here. He gave an example of how this works. So he says in um, verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me or shew me thy faith without thy works, and I will shew thee my faith by my works. Works are the evidence of, that you really believe what you say you believe. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Because some people say, oh, I believe in God. Yeah, I believe in God. Well, he says here, the devils believe and tremble. Verse 19, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And we know that every devil is going to be cast into the lake of fire. The devils are not going to be able to say, I believe in God. I believe there is one God. And God will say, oh, we'll bless you. Come and live with us in heaven for all of eternity. God didn't say that. He's going to cast them into the lake of fire. Okay? So watch this. Verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac unto his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. I'm going to use the illustration that, that James used here of Rahab. The two come into her, right? Old Testament, New Testament. Two witnesses. Isn't it cool? Two witnesses come to her and say, uh, God's going to destroy this city and everybody that's living in it. And Rahab says, I don't want to die. I believe 
you guys. I believe you two witnesses. Old Testament, New Testament. And I've even had people say, who say that well, James is not for us. I've had people say, oh, the Bible contradicts itself all the time. The Old Testament contradicts the New Testament. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Never. There are no contradictions in the Bible. Here's, here's what James is getting at. Here's Rahab, and she believes the two witnesses, the two spies. She believes God's word through them. Does her belief, does she really believe? Because the two witnesses told her, if you want to live, see this scarlet cord here? You hang that so that we can see it, and we're giving you our word that everybody who is in this house, this room, with the scarlet cord on it, everybody that's in here will be saved. And if you're not in here, and we don't, or we don't see that scarlet cord, we're telling you right now, we're going to go and kill everybody. Think of a Passover. God told the Israelites what they had to do. Moses believed what God said, and he's standing up eating roast lamb, with his stuff ready to go because they're going to leave. Now, had, Ab had Moses said, God, I believe you. You're going to destroy everybody. And had he had not put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, had he not been standing there with his stuff ready to go, eating roast lamb, had he not been doing those things, had God not seen the blood applied to Moses' house, the destroyer would have gone in and destroyed everybody in that house, including Moses. Moses said that he believed God, but he proved it by putting the blood, by applying the blood. And what I'm telling you is Rahab believed the two witnesses. How? How do we know she believed it? Because she hung that scarlet cord up there and they were inside that house waiting for this war to start. And Rahab is actually, she's a harlot, right? She's a dirty, nasty, whore, adulterer, fornicator, porn star. That's her. And yet she was one of the great grandmothers of Jesus. It was through her. One, I think one of these two spies said, you know what? I kind of like this gal. Well, don't you know what kind of woman she is? I know what kind of woman she was. But I'm going to make her my wife. And I'm going to, I'm going to purify her and glorify her. And she's going to be my bride. And let me tell you something. Jesus loves to take the people who are in whoredoms, the dirty people, the rejects, the nasty people, the people who don't get invited to the um, civics club banquet, the people who are the outcasts, the people who were sinners, but they believe what Jesus said, and they know the judgment's coming, and they know that it was the scarlet cord that saved them. Okay? Faith was evidenced by their works. Let me give you an illustration. You might say, and I, had, I wrote this down, you might say, I believe that the medicine the doctor gave me will save my life. Do you really believe that? Yes, of course I do. Are you taking it? No, I don't have to, because I just believe that the medicine will save me. Well, if you really believe the medicine will save you, why aren't you taking the medicine? You see, because I'm watching you, and I know that you don't take the medicine. So you go around telling me that you believe the doctor's medicine will give you, will save your life. I don't think you really believe that. If you really believed it, you'd be taking the medicine. Let me give another illustration. Remember what Jesus promised. You shall take up serpents. And, you know, if you drink anything, it'll not harm you. You, and you might say, I believe that I can drink poison and it will not harm me. Bless God. Really? Well, here's a glass with arsenic in it. I want you to drink it. I believe I can and it won't harm me. Well, here, drink it. No, I, I don't have to. I believe that I can drink it and it won't harm me. And if you believe it, then drink it. And let me tell you something. This lost world knows a phony Christian 
They go around bragging about what they can do and what they are and who, what they have and this and that. And they go around boasting about how they have faith. And yet the lost man who knows them knows that their actions betray their words, not confirm it. So Abraham, God could have said, Abraham, do you believe in me? Oh, of course I believe in you, Abraham. Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, and offer him up there for a burnt offering. Abraham, would you do that for me? Oh, of course I would, God. Then do it. And Abraham did it. Why? Because he believed it. And see, the thing is, we always do what we believe in. Everybody does that. There are no atheists who come to my church, put money in the offering plate, are willing to go out and invite others to our church, and amen the things that I say while I'm preaching. There are no atheists who come and do that. You know why? Because they don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God. They don't believe that what churches teach is even true because they don't even believe in God. They do what they believe in. They stay out of church. If an atheist starts attending church, his people, his friends, his family are going to say, where were you Sunday? I was in church. Well, I thought you were an atheist. I am. Did you like put money in the collection plate? Oh, yeah, I gave him a, gave him a generous gift. And I, I, I think you all would come with me. But you're an atheist. Yeah, I am. But you're going to church. See, they don't believe it. It's contradictory. And what James is teaching here is that if you say you have faith, if you say that you believe this Bible, then the manifestation of the fruit of this Bible will be manifested in your life. I don't do the works so that I can get grace. I do the works because I already have the grace, because I trust God. And I don't want my actions to be contradictory to what comes out of my mouth. I believe in this book. I believe it's right. And because of that, I'm sitting here in front of this camera today explaining to you how right this Bible is. And if I didn't believe this Bible, I wouldn't be doing this. But I believe it. I believe every word of it. I don't understand it all. But I believe it. And I encourage you to believe it. And if you tell people that you believe the Bible and you believe God's word and you believe that certain things are wrong and certain things are right and yet everything in your life contradicts to the lost family member of yours or your lost friends, everything they know about you contradicts what you just said. They know that you don't have faith. Abraham believed God so much that the Bible even says that Abraham was thinking as he's laying Isaac on the altar, when I kill him, I believe God's going to raise him back from the dead. He believed God. And as he, and here's another thing with me, and I'm going to be done. The King James says, offer your son, Isaac. The NIV says, sacrifice him. God did not tell Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. He told him to offer him. And that is precisely what Abraham did. He laid him on the altar, and he was ready to plunge the knife in. And as, as the, that point, Abraham did what God told him to do because he believed what God said. Had Abraham not believed what God said, he would have never put his son on that altar and never taken that knife in his hand. He would have not have done it. But he believed it. And his belief showed up in his actions. And it's that simple because you and I both know that for every real member of the body of Jesus Christ, born again, say, believe the Bible for every one member, you and I both know there's probably 10,000 phony church members, fake, who amen the sermon, say they believe it, but everything in their life denounces it, every it's just that simple. Do you believe? Do you believe? And if you do, the manifestation of what you believe will be coming forth in your life. God will see it, you'll see it, and everybody around you will see it.
All right? We're going to move on from there, still in Galatians chapter 3. I hope you've enjoyed this. You pray for my throat that I <clears throat> can clear it up a little bit. And uh, remember that you're the reason why we do what we do. God loves you. I love you. Thank you for loving me and long-suffering with me. And you pray for us always, and we'll continue to do the work that God has given us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.